And now he's going to talk to us about right time, wrong place, navigating the territorial trap in the study of medieval religion. Please welcome Ryan Speech. When Florentine Dominican Ricardo de Monte de Croce returned to Italy around the year 1300 after travels in the Holy Land, to Greece and Iraq, and nearly a decade in Baghdad, he finalized two works of religious polemic, both intended to equip future missionary friars in their upcoming polemical encounters. The two texts would face very different fates. The first, an anti-Muslim polemic known as the Contra Legem Saracenorum, uh, against the law of the Saracens, based on his Latin Quran manuscript, which we still have today, uh, and is quite amazing, uh, would end up as one of the most cited and influential Christian texts about Islam in the Latin world. Ricardo then wrote the second, the Libellus ad Nationes Orientales, in quick succession after the Contralegum, but it would end up receiving much less attention and still remains unpublished. Yet, the Libellus offers us a very interesting point of departure today. Rather than focusing only on Islam as the contralegum, the Libellus takes up the broader landscape of religious diversity that Ricardo encountered in Mongol controlled Baghdad, including a section on Christian heretics, that is, Nestorians and Syrian Jacobites, a section on Jews, a short section on Tatars, perhaps uh, Mongols, <laughs> and a general list for missionaries, sort of a good list of good advice and best practices. And beginning in the prologue, he meditates on Psalm 119, verse 155. Salvation is far from the wicked. He observes, it does not say how far, either because the wicked are so distant they cannot return to God without God's benevolence, or because the distance is not the same for all. For some are far, some are farther, and some are farthest. More interesting still, this measure of salvation in terms of distance corresponds inversely for Ricoldo to what he we might call convertibility, the facility with which each group could be successfully converted to Christianity. So he says, just as Jews seem to differ more from true Christians than Christian heretics, so Muslims seem more distant than Jews and Tatars more distant than Muslims. By contrast, addressing what he calls the effect of nearness and conversion, that is, uh, quantum ad effectum a propinquationes et conversiones, is the key phrase, he says, it is completely opposite. Tatars are more easily converted than Saracens, Saracens more easily converted than Jews, and Jews more easily than heretics, end quote. What interests me about this fascinating observation is that it employs a spatial metaphor to conjure spiritual identity placing everyone on a sliding scale of truth based on their apparent, should we say, propinquity to Christian belief. My intention today is to make use of Ricoldo's observation as a starting point to explore a broader question that I believe is germane to the discussions many of us will have this week at Leeds. How religious identity, communal and individual, might be cast in spatial terms. How distance can serve as a proxy for heresy and infidelity, and how the language of borders might serve to mark or distort perceived differences. I'm led to this topic by my sense that there is much to do. If we medievalists may possibly have succeeded in creating fitting models of medieval time, cycles of liturgical hours or ecclesiastical years, the chronos of royal annals or kairos of millenarianist expectations, we have, I think, so far quite fallen short in our historiography of space. We are, as it were, getting time right, but maybe still in the wrong place. Thus, I'd like to probe the implications of the metaphors of geography. And so this lecture will offer a few reflections on the use of spatial language in medieval religious contact and change, including above all religious conversion. It will consider how polemical debate sometimes made use of spatial or directional metaphors and how conversion can often be cast as a departure or migration, a movement between spaces or across borders. I want to ask both what role space played in medieval expressions of belief and also what role spatial metaphors have come to play in our own historicization of religious phenomena. 
Sources relating to medieval religion offer us, I think, a stark interpretive choice, one in which we can respond with something like interpretive humility over what we can and cannot know, or one in which we succumb to a kind of hermeneutic temptation to try to fix the contours of religious phenomena like a cartographer might fix the borders uh, around a space. I suggest we should be mindful about spatial metaphors and how they can impose a kind of conceptual uniformity on understanding that glosses over the particularities of local circumstance. And in looking at religious encounters in the past, I say we should be uh, eager to find a way to interpret and employ the metaphors of religious change without falling into the conceptual traps they lay before us. So to begin, how do medieval sources make use of space as a metaphor of belief and identity? Of course, the question is enormous and too ambitious for my modest capacities, perhaps anyone, and certainly for the brief moments we have here today. And I can refer eager listeners to any number of enlightening texts uh, on this question from Eldon's The Birth of Territory, Rockbari's Idols in the East, to Travis Zeta's Mapping Frontiers Across Medieval Islam, many others. But given that I started with Ricoldo, let me go there and note the interesting fact that in his claim that each of these groups, heretics, Jews, Muslims, and Tatars, seems to differ more from the last, the phrase he uses, magis videntar distare, is key. The verb distare seems to have both the meaning of to be distant from and also to differ from. In Ricardo's logic, space here is not just an empirical quantity of space, but an index of mythical quality. And movement in this metaphorical space, closing the distance between true Christianity and its shades of otherness, is a form of spiritual transformation and also a kind of categorical travel. Michel Foucault, uh, no medievalist, obviously, but useful here for a second because he thought a lot about space, calls medieval space a hierarchic ensemble of places, sacred and profane, protected and exposed, urban and rural, super celestial as opposed to celestial. And he gives actually a longer list than this. And if we doubt his judgment, which we're wise to do often, let us recall the topography of Dante's Divine Comedy, the nine Cerchi of Inferno, or the seven Cornici of Purgatorio, or the nine Celi of Paradiso, all hierarchic ensembles par excellence. These are, in Bakhtin's words, chronotopes, manifestations of time in space. And the time here measured is that of conversion, the soul's journey from sin to salvation. That Ricardo should invoke this conceit uh, of space as spirituality is not at all surprising. After all, he seems to have written his words precisely in Florence around the year 1301, not a decade before Dante, having been kicked out next the year after, began drafting the Commedia. But apart from such interesting coincidences, the talk of spiritual difference as, as physical distance, or simply of salvation as a journey, were entirely commonplace. It's not only in the context of conversion that the formula holds, distance is a marker of difference in cartographic terms as well. Peak abundant leones, we can read, here lions abound, says the top edge of the very well-known cotton manuscript Tiberius BV1, probably copied from a Roman model. Later legend, of course, recasts this admonition in the more famous and popular but mostly apocryphal phrase Ixunt dracones, here be dragons, but of course this wording does not appear in the sources, really only appears on um, one or two things. The Hunt Lennox Globe of 1510 has this curious little phrase. And the recently identified Ostrich Egg Globe, or as Stefan Misine hopefully dubs it, the Da Vinci Globe. To be sure, as we know, pictures of dragony beasts do enliven our borders on medieval maps, as in the well-known Salter world map familiar to everyone. But it is remembering that these distant monsters are not usually in a fully known territory. That is, they're often in a terra incognita, as Palomese geography might have it. Such unknowns, and this is my point, are key parts of medieval spatial understanding. We're all familiar 
with medieval maps, the common T and O maps of Christian thought that divide the world into three zones, Asia, Africa, and Europe. But it's interesting to note that this wasn't entirely mythologized in the beginning. Uh, in the earliest manuscript of De Natura Rerum, dating from the seventh century, we, we get a simple tripartite structure without any commentary at all. And it's only in the ninth century uh, that any kind of exegesis is added in which the names of Noah's sons are added to each space. And this Isidorian scheme is what came to be embodied in the many Beatus, Mapai Mundi, some 14 of which have come down to us, beginning with the rectangular Morgan Beatus of the 940s. And part of this mythologizing involved the contemplation of this space, this empty space to the right. On the Morgan map, we see beyond Ethiopia, if we tip the map sideways, we can read in a large block spanning Africa and Asia. The neighboring desolate land is hardened by heat and is unknown to us. Adam Nobler has suggested the term the power of distance in medieval sources to affect, uh, to describe the effect of amplification of imagined qualities of power, military or political, as corresponding to distance from world centers. With dragons and lions on the brain, we might rename this as the monstrosity of difference the heightening of strangeness as a factor of remoteness. And in either case, the effect of distance is not premised on sharp definitions, but on an increasingly vague uncertainty. That is, difference as distance is not about fixed borders. Difference lay empty or partially known somewhere beyond the pale, but not always firmly bound by it. It's at the opposite end of the oikomene, the known world, Difference and distance here exist in dialectical tension with the known and the inhabited. As Alfred Hyatt puts it aptly, before modern cartography, terra incognita was land unknown, but certainly not unthought. The fact here is important to stress, medieval cartographic borders, such as they are, may have signaled differences, and we're familiar with many of these images, differences in climate zones following Macrobius, or in, say, lands and peoples, as in the large Catalan Atlas from 1375, giving us many of our famous images of uh, people and beasts. And of course, this synthesizes legends from Marco Polo's Book of Marvels, Mandibles Travels, and other existing map by Mundi, and even perhaps better known here, the Hereford map of 1300, draws on standard descriptions of Pliny and Isidore and depicts some 50 or more of these creatures from the great fun one-footed skiopods to the cyclops and many others, including the uh, dog-headed cynocephalon. But even as these things are sketched out and given spaces, they, they're not exhaustively explained. And the idea is that to be distant here is still to be different, but also, and perhaps counterintuitively, to be undefined. To be different was to be borderless. Numerous scholars have considered the history of concepts of territory and affirmed that borders in our modern geopolitical sense, of course, as demarcation lines spanning polities and their respective spheres of action, were essentially unknown in the Middle Ages or so different as to be unrecognizable and almost uh, irrelevant. As Ronnie Ellenbloom states, quote, the idea of political borders is very rare in the Middle Ages, and even if such lines actually exist, they were of little importance, unquote. And Ralph Bauer says almost the exact same thing about the Islamic world. Only a modern abstract notion of legal jurisdiction and rights can support an abstract spatial representation of power and polity as defined by modern border lines. Rhys Jones who's written quite a lot about the proliferation of modern border walls around the world, summarizes this and says, before, quote, before the modern era, there was not a systematic use of bounded territories to signify political claims. The borders on the Catalan Atlas or earlier Mapai Mundi or any of these uh, uh, related maps and any number of contemporary Islamic maps are not factitious in any political or social sense. They are semi-mythological. That is, regions from the stage of something like salvation history, punctuated by token natural landmarks. Borders bind human spaces that can be known, fortified cities, walled gardens, the house of the faithful. 
as Peter Schlotterdijk notes in his Spherology, Noah's Ark is a kind of walled city in the void of the sea, and was a primeval projection of the covenant God would establish with the Israelites, marking them off and their land off as chosen, ordered, and known. Borders, like city walls, separated the known from the unknown, the inland sea from the encircling ocean, but also order from chaos, purity from impurity, and life from death. And as cartographic maps did not attempt to be spatially comprehensive or geographically mimetic, they conjure a world in which the unknown lies beyond natural borders and cannot fully be known. Wonders are there beyond the pillars of Hercules, or beyond the wall against Gog and Magog, or Yajuj Wamajuj. There were, by definition, always more things in heaven and earth than were dreamt of in human cartography. Only in the 16th century, with Abraham Ortelius's famous Theatrum Orbis Terrarum of 1570, we all know this map from grade school, could Terra Incognita become Terra Nondum Cognita, that is, a land not yet known. Medieval borders, by contrast, were not tools of sovereignty or indices of expanding knowledge, but figures of thought and belief. Or in the language of exegesis, they are tropological or maybe anagogical. So if borders of cartography are figural, what are they figures of? Cartographic depictions of the known world and its limits correspond largely to narrative representations of sacred history. That is, they're soteriological borders, not geographical. And so movement across such space corresponds similarly to movement from ignorance to knowledge or infidelity to faith. In such regions, knowledge and faith do not travel as in the modern Eurocentric figure of thought from east to west, but instead across time, from past to present, or as Akabari notes, centripetally or centripetally, that is emanating out and returning to centers of spiritual origin and talos, Jerusalem or Mecca. The famous Carta Rogeriana of a geographer or cartographer Ali Drisi, maybe, is much admired for its knowledge and mimetic qualities, and for it's easier to see upside down since south is at the top. But whether we see it as having been elaborated at the court of Roger or Palermo, or whether we see it as a later forgery, which many do and which it may well be, since we don't have any copies of it um, from his period. In any case, it is not typical or representative of medieval Islamic cartography, which is, I think, better typified, as Karen Pinto suggests, by the Atlas maps, the so called, maybe misnamed, Balki Istakri school of the Kitab Masalik Wal Mamalik, the Book of Roads and Kingdoms. Now, although not derived from the Isidorean TO map tradition, it nevertheless ends up dividing the world into three zones, but according to a new name, one that concedes equal space to Africa alongside Asia, and only a tiny little bit to Europe. Maps of the Mediterranean, medieval Islamic maps of the Mediterranean, as Pinto notes, are often symmetrical and abstract, and similarities between these maps of the Mediterranean, which you can see here, and diagrams of Christian churches, especially in Constantinople, reflect a Muslim view of the Mediterranean, perhaps as a predominantly Christian space or at least Pinto suggests this is a possible interpretation. But however they're interpreted, as Travis Zada explains, the conceptual borders, quote, mapped out in a geography of salvation serve as imagined conceits, and thus are not to be found in being, but in language, unquote. And we might add language about the topography of faith. In a sense, figural or figurative maps can be construed as visual correlates of another kind of representation of figurative distance. One made in narrative terms, moving from past to present or error to truth. And here I mean conversion stories. It should not surprise us to find cartography and conversion overlapping. Many stories of conversion are also stories of movement and travel. One of the best known anecdotes of conversion among the fragments of the Cairo Geniza, that storeroom of documents here in the Ben Ezra synagogue, illuminating Jewish life in the Mediterranean between the 9th and 19th centuries, is the story of the Norman convert from Christianity to Judaism known as Juan Lopido, or after his conversion around 1102, with the generic convert name Ovadja Hager 
In his brief tale, which he says is written in his own hand, we hear tell of a series of prophetic dreams that led him to abandon his native city of Opido and make a new life in Baghdad, Aleppo, and Cairo. He claims his path to Judaism was prefigured by a story he heard in his childhood, the story of the conversion of one Andreas, Archbishop of Bari, whom he actually is confusing with Urte, but He says Andreas, quote, forsook his land and his priesthood and his glory and turned to Egypt. Owaja too vouches his own story in geographical terms. He says he heard the events concerning Andreas when he was still a youth in the house of Drew, his father. Now these are the names of the cities around Opita, the birthplace of Duan, to the west, the cities of Rome, he says, Salerno, Potenza, the town of Pietragala, to the east, the city of Bari, the town of Monte Peloso, the town of Genanza, to the north, the city of Atarenza, Polo, and Alba, and so on. And he gives a long list of his geographical coordinates, putting his conversion on the map. We can tend to find this repetition, or a repetition of this geographical motif in other conversion stories. Leaving one religion for another entails leaving one place for another, one community or one bordered space for another. As Moshe Yabur of Tel Aviv University now has argued about converts in the Cairo Geniza, quote, one of the most frequent descriptions of a convert is as someone who has departed, digressed, overstepped religion, law, or Torah. It is possible then that terms such as exiting and entering, or more generally, crossing of borders, more accurately describe the subjects of this study than conversion. The description of converts with a term related to borders and their crossing, and hence to the social significance that is so fundamental to the matter of conversion, offers us more precision. Unquote. Yavur, like Shlomo Gotein or Norman Gold before him, had chronicled many such converts in the Cairo Geniza. One little fragment tells us of a French woman in the 11th century in Narbonne who converted to Judaism and quote, went forth from the house of her father, from great wealth, and from a distant land. And then when her husband was killed and children, her children taken captive, she fled to Cairo, where she appears in the records. Another fragment tells us of Rachel, the Rumi proselyte, that is a European founder, who writes, my husband Joseph from Barcelona took me from my land and brought me to Alexandria. Another 11th century letter on behalf of a former Christian says, from my youth, I recognized that the uncircumcised walk in darkness. I sought the religion of Israel and fled toward Damascus. The Christian elders attempted to entice me to return, but I told them their statutes were vanity. I desired to go on to Egypt. These fragments, and there are many, say very little about the nuances of belief, or what we might call faith, and focus instead on origins and physical movements and relocations between communities. I think we're wrong to take these changes of place at simple face value, as though they cannot be both literal and figurative at the same time. After all, biblical and Talmudic vocabularies of faith and faithlessness are always premised on spatial metaphors. The motif of Abraham as the first convert is, of course, based on God's command to, quote, leave your country and your family and your father's house and go to the land I will show you. And certainly, early Christian writing directly evokes Abraham's leave taking, as when Jesus says in Matthew, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mothers or fathers or children or land for my sake or the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold back. Metaphor. Aristotle reminds us in the poetics, consists in giving the thing a name that belongs to something else. The language of conversion, no matter the context, is naturally metaphorical because the phenomenon of changing religions, while very real in experience, is intangible. In scenes of conversion, then, abstract sense is rendered dynamic through physical metaphors, such as crossing space or distance, movement from one center to another. Consider the wealth of physical ways that conversion is described in the sources. It is to turn or to return, shu, tshuva in Hebrew or epistrepho in Greek, to cast off the cloak of falsehood, exuere, harium falsitatis, or to denude the tunic of iniquity, nudare tunica iniquitatis, to take refuge beneath God's wings, laxot pachat panafe hashkina, or to enter religion, as Samuel Magrivi says, or to exit the law, 
The mixed pedigree of Christian ideals of conversion as both a Hebrew motif of departure and return and a Greek motif of mental turn to truth produced an interplay in Christian conversion stories between tangible and intangible movements, spiritual and physical travel. Miguel Herrera de Jauregui has argued that well, conversion is a spatial metaphor in which one goes from one place, that of evil and error, to another, that of virtue and truth. The metaphor requires a definition of the point of departure and of arrival. Half a century after Obadja, Herman Judah of Cologne claimed he was converted while traveling in Mainz on business, staying in a foreign house. The Castilian Jew Abner left his home in Burgos in 1320 to take a new name and a new city name. And such motifs are found throughout the archives. In the chancery records of the Crown of Aragon, we read of Bernat Nadal, who happened, it says, to be traveling in the region of Bougie and the Barbary Coast when he was led by a diabolic spirit and chose the sect of Muhammad, denying the name of the Lord. Moroccan convert Anselm Turmeya journeyed to Tunis to profess Islam and take a new name, Abdallah al Tarfiman. And the theme, of course, appears in travel literature. Pero Kapur relates in his Castilian narrative. Andanzas e Viajes from 1454 about meeting the chief interpreter of the Sultan of Cairo. He says, he's not from here. He was born and brought as a child to Jerusalem with his father, who was a Jew. When his father died, he turned more. At first they called him Haim and now Sam. To read these and many other similar accounts, we might combine Bruce Hindmarsh's suggestion that, quote, all narratives are, in one sense, conversion narratives, unquote. With Michel de Certeau's pointed observation, every story is a travel story, a spatial practice. The metaphorical rendering of place and space in conversion employs what cognitive linguists George Lakoff and Mark Johnson have deemed a directionality metaphor. That is, the use of a figurative image of physical movement to describe intangible or non-physical changes. As they explain, we tend to structure the less concrete and inherently vaguer concepts like say the emotions or spirituality in terms of more concrete concepts delineated in our experience. The underlying argument of this theory, which we can call embodied cognition, is that metaphors are not simply an aspect of thought or expression, but the form of it, constitutive of expression and understanding. And certainly in the case of conversion, meaning does not exist apart from its metaphorical patterns, which are always evoked as physical journeys. An illuminating example of the directionality topos in polemical arguments, they're always linked implicitly or explicitly to conversion, are Christian attacks on Jewish belief that invoke the right to left thinking as apparently a contrary form. The Isagogian Theologiam by one Odo in mid 12th century France affirms that the Hebrew language descends from right to left, just as in contrast, both Greek and Latin ascend from left to right. So the fall of the Jews and the raising up of the Gentiles is depicted. Such claims are not confined to Jewish Christian debate. In the so-called Christian Kasida of the 12th century Persian poet Khakani, fate or falak is the course of heaven, is unpredictable and more crooked than the writing of the Christians. That is Greek. The Muslim poet pretends to contemplate conversion to Christianity, mocking the Christians by proposing a change in writing directions. He mocks Shall I prepare a Syriac commentary, written right to left, on the Gospels, left to right, and then just rejects the idea as nothing more than changing course of travel from the Qibla to Jerusalem? If crossing borders here represents transgression in medieval polemical and conversionary writing, it certainly is quite the opposite in our value system in present day cultural criticism, because as we are all seeing today, border language is everywhere, especially on religious studies. One does not have to look far for representative titles. Two well known examples jump to mind Daniel Boyan's Border Lines, The Partition of Judeo Christianity, Sharon Kinoshida's fine book, Medieval, uh, book, Medieval Boundaries Rethinking Difference in Old French Literature. But these are just the tip of the iceberg. Many books called Beyond Religious Borders, Crossing Religious Borders, and the pithiest of all, Crossing Borders. An amazingly popular title with dozens and dozens of books and articles with this same title. 
including at least five on the Middle Ages from the last 15 years. I think we need to spice it up a little. <laughs> I found this popularity, the popularity of borders to discuss medieval religion and culture, suspiciously presentist. <laughs> I recognize some metaphor is needed, and certainly this is heuristically useful, and under the current circumstances, it's on our minds, but the particular metaphor of border crossing carries with it a host of conceptual dangers for the medievalist. Not only does it lend itself to further metaphors of intentionality, moralizing conversion as a bold transgression across red lines, a taking refuge, a treason, an escape, it also succumbs to a particular risk that has been amply discussed in the field of political geography. What geographer John Agnew named in a foundational article in 1994, the territorial trap. Agnew defines this as a set of false assumptions made in discussion of present day political entities and lists three core fallacies. So I'll read quickly. State territories have been reified as a set of fixed units of sovereign space. The use of domestic, foreign, national, international polarities serves to obscure the interaction between processes operating at different scales. And third of all, the territorial state has been viewed as existing prior to and a as a container of society. It's my suggestion that we can benefit from keeping guard from similar assumptions at work in our own sources. So swapping out the amorphous notion of territory with the equally or perhaps more problematic term identity, we can see the potential of border metaphors to reify the latter identity as a uniform space under the sovereign control of some rational individual agent. The reliance on binaries, in our case, inner outer or confessional ritual or individual collective or belief heresy, similarly obscures force and overlapping scales of action. And this also tends to produce an unwanted hierarchy of meaning in religious studies, in which some aspects of religious phenomena and aspects of experience like sincerity or authenticity are taken to be more meaningful than other actions or aspects, say, mimetic ritual action. In this understanding, the so-called sovereign self, the territorial state of the individual is seen as the primary vessel of religious meaning, a core site of conversion rather than the outer trappings of the body. And as in the political language of territory, the use of borders in religious studies can produce an artificial uniformity in which identities are assumed to be uniform across individual selves and homogeneous across religious communities. So one is either Jewish or Christian, all Muslim or all not Muslim. And so hybrid identities, say the child of parents from different communities or believers who cherry pick or simply don't believe are treated as anomalous or interesting. Border thinking produces black and white dichotomies that allow for no natural gray zone and assume total uniformity within so-called given borders. Such thinking operates, like modern cartography, to maximize knowledge, accounting for all known space and leaving no phenomena as terra incognita. As Hank Van Kertum has noted, if the territorial trap is operational in political geography, it is all the more so in the cartography of cultural movement, what he calls the migration map trap. In his view, our ubiquitous maps with arrows indicating spreads and conquests and migrations and flows are all complicit in flattening historical processes or homogenizing populations or, quote, translating ethnocentric worldviews onto political maps, unquote. In a similar sense, cartographic metaphors can impose presentist models of cultural value onto medieval scenes of contact, encounter, and change. I suggest to us that the risk of not working to avoid these conceptual traps is serious. As Lakoff and Johnson explained, metaphors create realities for us, especially social realities. Metaphors can be self-fulfilling prophecies. So how to avoid this pitfall in our discussions of medieval religion? In political terms, Agnew argues that only historical geographical consciousness can free us from what he calls the dead hand of the territorial trap. In medieval studies, to avoid reifying the fluid metaphors we use as universal categories, I suggest we impose a self-limiting paradigm of religious phenomena, one that resists speaking of conversion or revelation or any form of theophany in universal, factual, or generically categorical terms. 
That is, historians should not attempt to analyze and write about conversion per se, but rather about the discourse of conversion, the images of conversion, about conversion's metaphors and representations, tracing the Freudian ways that religious experience is constructed and imagined in the texts and images that are offered to us and refraining from imposing a larger trans-historical category. In a sense, this conclusion is only to concur with David Abu Rafi's call to, quote, understand the medieval frontier according to the political language of the time, end quote. And I suggest we extend the thought to other spheres, being mindful that border language is never neutral. Recall the cold of difference as distance paradigm. And certainly this border language can be particularly inappropriate and distorting as a lens to view medieval religion. To speak of different religious communities as having borders, to cast contact and conversion or translation and exchange as border crossing, can impose artificial uniformity on individuals and communities and reduce the complexity of interactions to simple binary equations of change. Navigating around such tracks of thinking and approaching religious phenomena as culturally specific constructions of metaphor and language, we can see historical distance as difference, but also leave it as indistinct, as partly undefined. This path, I suggest, allows us to interpret medieval categories and metaphors with something like empathy and humility, rather than through the imperious biases of our own mental geography. This path perhaps leads us back to a world in which terra incognita still remains something of an inviolate marvel, a spur to the imagination and the spirit, an unfixed and partly unbounded locus of imagination beyond knowledge, <laughs> one that intimates to us, in Travis Zadar's words, the sublime design of difference itself. Thank you. <laughs>